It's December of 2021, and I still have not found my personal copy of the Declaration of Independence. This is the Focus Group. They're all business, except when they're not. It's the Focus Group with Tim Bennett and John Nash. Welcome to the Focus Group. John Nash here with my good friend and co-host, Tim Bennett. Focusgroupradio.com is our website, and if you go there, you'll find all about all about us and our shows, including TFG Unbuttoned, our Tuesday podcast, which is about 20 minutes long, and you'll see our partners there and all our media's housed there as well. Welcome to the first day of December. I kicked off the show with that uh, mention of my personal copy of the Declaration of Independence. It hooks into what caught my eye, which we'll get to in a little bit, and the show format is Caught My Eye, and that's uh, items that Tim and I find of interest and we bring to the table or bring to you. They're usually extremely different as it reflects our personalities. Then we have a visit with our partner Deep Discount to recommend some content, a quick break, followed by a business birthday, the only show in the universe that does business birthdays, curated by yours truly, Mr. Tim Bennett, and some shop talk. In the shop talk today, we're gonna be looking at uh, a former Starbucks executive has his top four business books that he recommends. And Tim and I have a love and love and hate relationship with business books. So when we get to that, you'll see what we mean. So without further ado, Tim, uh, it's the official first day of December, the last month of 2021. Yeah, I um, know. I got my hair cut. Yeah, I like your haircut, by the way. And I like your so new glasses, gonna, too. Yeah. Well, I, I so Fernando in South Philly has been cutting my hair since 1994. 94 are you serious i've never had a barber that long i wish i did but i've never had it wow that's great and i love fernando but uh so during the um thanksgiving holiday i I was driving through philly and i thought i'll see if fernando can cut my hair and he could not because there was a plumbing problem at the salon that uh, (laughs) he uses you don't want a plumbing problem at the salon do you yeah so he said he said i'm sorry i can't and my hair was a mess so uh i tried a place down here called the grateful head down in Rehoboth Beach. Whoa, whoa, it just whoa, opened whoa, up. Whoa, whoa, wait a minute. Wait a minute. I knew that when you drove up, you made a pit stop in Philly specifically for hair and to drop off Spike. So you did this down in Rehoboth? Right. So then when I came back, so I, I looked here. So I tried to get a haircut in Rehoboth last summer. And I walk into this one place. It was empty. Nobody's in there. The guy that owns the salon is sitting there. So and I just want to trim around my ears. I said, Could you trim my hair? I can't. I'm busy. There's nobody there. I said, oh, okay. I said, well, I just needed a trim. It might have taken 35 <laughs> seconds to take the clipper and go around my ears. You'll have to make an appointment. I said, well, when's the next appointment? Ten days. I, so I said, Ten well, days? This. Ten days. Right. <laughs> so then I just go online. I try to look at these next door apps and find a place to get a haircut. I'll tell you what. If you are a handyman, you cut hair or you're a veterinarian, or a doctor. Plumber, electrician, come, right? Come, yep. to some, come to Southern Delaware, you'll make a killing. So <laughs> I, um, so this guy, Aaron, he's a, I think he cut hair in New York, and this other guy, Richard, that owned the salon. Um, it's called The Grateful Head, and it's right on Baltimore Avenue. And so I went there, I made an appointment, and I thought it was very fairly priced, and uh, so he cut my hair. I like so it. That's Are it. you happy with the cut? Yeah, I, you know, I, but it's weird after 27 years of the same guy doing it. I mean, Fernando, he knows, you know, think about 27 years. I mean, it's a long relationship. You know, I've I've been through his dating life, his bachelor life, his married (laughs) life, his divorce, his children, um, his new marriage. You know, I mean, we've, we've gone through each other's careers and, um, you know, it's a personal relationship, right? I, I tell you there, um, I, my favorite when I had hair that required this, the, uh, the visit to the salon, it was my favorite thing, you know, and I used to have a, I think I've told the story before I had an Irish hair cutter named Tommy and Tommy used to come in and it was, you get your hair washed, sit down. And, and at, long after I started, you know, being able to cut my own hair because it's so short, I saw him on the street one day and he goes, Oh love, we've missed you at the salon so much. You're one of our favorites. We miss you. And I see you've given up the ghost. I've given up the ghost. He goes, come into the salon and having us cut your hair. You could, you know, he goes, crew cut looks fine on you, love. I could have told you that a long time ago, but we really love seeing you at the salon. <laughs> oh, that's funny. And then I had one uh, haircutter named Michael. 
uh, who used to own a salon on 8th Avenue. And uh, it's like your guy, uh, Fernando, where I knew all about his relationships. And he disappeared for three weeks. And that's when he went to have um, liposuction done. And all the other caddy hairstylists are like, that's not going to last. He eats too. He, he hasn't controlled his eating. He could get that stuff sucked away, baby, but it's going to come back. I mean, how can you <laughs> not get enjoy that kind of experience, right? Yeah. No, it's uh, so... Yeah, that, so that's I came down here, and that's, uh, so that's it. As we march on to the holidays, is that going to be your new place? Then can you go there from now on? Well, I feel like I owe Fernando an explanation. I don't know. We'll have to see. Yeah, well, I like this guy Aaron that cut the hair. I think he did a good job. Well, look, I mean, you can't. You, you're not going to j- cut your hair every time you're driving through Philly, right? I mean, you, no. So there is a reality check here. He knows you're down in, in Southern Delaware, right? Yeah, and Fernando can only cut hair on Tuesdays. See, yeah. All right. So I, the when chances I gave, of me going through on Tuesdays are, are not likely. I'm sure a lot of who, people who are listening uh, would not about this. Like, you have a relationship with the hair cutter. When they move on, when something changes, it does seem to unbalance your universe. And I, the, the last barber I had, I used to call the golden scissors. I used to love him. And he left the salon or the barbershop he was at, and someone else took his place and... I didn't like them and I just stopped going. And I saw the owner one day. He's like, why'd you, and this is when I went to crew cut. And he goes, yeah, I know that's fine. Don't worry about it. He goes, it's a very personal thing. So, um, so well, I had to do that with my doctor. You know, my doctor went to a new practice, practice yeah. and, um, they were awful. And I, and I said so to the doctor and he just kind of, you know, he went for financial reasons because of Pennsylvania insurance mm-hmm. and malpractice insurance and all this stuff. But, I, I felt after going to him for 25 years or whatever it was that he was not um, compassionate, I guess. Maybe that's the wrong word. But so I just moved on. And uh, But now my dentist is new, too, that my doctor, my dentist sold his practice. And he sold it to a group of younger women. And uh, it doesn't run as uh, timely, or timely. As, as, <laughs> as he did. So, but they, so far so good, but, um, I need to find a new dentist, you know, moving down here now, I need to find all new doctors and dentists and there's not, uh, as the population down here has exploded, it's not very easy to find, uh, Tim, find it doesn't doctors. matter where you are. It's impo- It's hard to like our dentist had to retire quite suddenly and uh, he'd been our dentist for over 20 some years. He had to take care of his wife who had a, a condition that he had been keeping very close track of, but needed to be closer to home. Cause he used to come up from Pennsylvania to the city and he had a, all my friends went to this practice and, uh, we had to, we find, we found a new dentist. She turns out to have live in our old apartment building. We didn't even know she was a dentist for all these years and she's great and we're happy, but it's one of those weird things. It's, it's, yeah. you got to recalibrate the relationship. So, well, yeah. there you go. Here we are. We're not talking about Rudolph or Santa or any of this stuff on we're talking about mundane things like doctors and haircuts, which they're not so mundane, right? Yeah. Well, so there you go. All right, without further ado, what caught your eye? What caught your eye? Here's what Tim and John found. Well, unless you haven't been keeping up with what's hot or not in North Korea, John. <laughs> your, uh... Is there such a thing as a hot or not list for North Korea? I mean, Well, apparently, you know, earlier this year, they, they did a crackdown on, uh, they banned mullets and skinny jeans because uh, they thought that that was a, a pushback against, uh, it was a pushback against the exotic and decadent influence of capitalism. So the dear leader decided that, uh, and also K-pop, which came from South Korea, they, uh, the dear leader called that vicious cancer. So there were no mullets allowed and no skinny jeans allowed in North Korea at the beginning of the year. So now the dear leader has been, re- been uh, wearing leather jackets. Uh, apparently he feels that the coats make him, uh, give him a cut of like a macho figure or sophisticate an air of sophistication very, or coolness shows that he's very sporting and prosperous even though he's five eight and 300 pounds of platform shoes um <laughs> and, and and show him as a fashion leader mr king kim jong-un and his sister you know kim uh his sister's name and i, I want to get this right kim yo jong who I don't know if you've seen the sister, but she'll cut your balls off and, and eat them in front of you. I mean, she's a hard ass. She looks like she had some kind of special KGB training or something. I mean, she, well, yeah, she's, I've seen she's her. The she's very successor. Is severe the word you want to use? Like she has a yeah. severe like, don't cross me, or you're you're uh, you're toast. Yeah. Yeah, she she may kill the brother. Don't be surprised. But she's the she's the chosen successor of the the dear leader. Now they're not calling him the dear leader so much anymore. He's got a new name. They're calling him the highest dignity. 
The highest so dignity. Yeah, yeah, okay. The highest dignity. Yeah. So he's been wearing these leather coats, and then they've shown him at some of these missile ranges and the military parades when they drag those paper mache weapons down the boulevard in Pyongyang. <laughs> and um, he's, uh, you know, a lot of those are paper mache, right? I, I do. And I'm glad you're making the point that it's paper. They're not going to be trundling that stuff around. It wastes tons. It's paper mache. Right. Let's take the armaments out for yeah. spin. Let's do a new paint coat. It's a new missile. <laughs> well, that's and all of well, anyway, that's a cyborg. But so anyway, they they he got up. So Kim Jong Un got upset because people were th- these uh, other. So he gets these things tailored apparently in China, and uh, so they brought in these leather coats. He's got white leather coats. He's got black leather coats. If you're watching the video, you'll see him cutting quite a figure in these coats. And uh, so apparently, the uh, some of these people in town or ever in Pyongyang and in North Korea decided they were going to wear these leather coats. As a sign of sophistication, as a sign of prosperity, you know, most people there don't, you know, they can't feed a cat and uh, they eat them. So they can't feed a cat and they, you know, they end up um, thinking that this was going to show some sort of um, some sort of sort of wealth if they wore these jackets. And so there was lots of cheap fake leather knockoffs. And so the highest dignity, Kim Jong Un, got upset and sent out the fashion police. Um, and said that he doesn't want anybody else wearing leather jackets. <laughs> Seriously? Okay. Yeah, yeah, because they felt that um, they didn't know whether. But you just uh, said they, that most people couldn't afford a leather jacket to begin with, right? But people but, are but getting be these safe. Fakes. Okay, okay. And so the highest dignity is thinking that um, either they're making fun of him because they don't look so good in them because they're cheap knockoffs, or they're trying to emulate him. But either way, you're not supposed to do that. And so they said that the literal, they call them the fashion police, are confiscating these leather coats and fake leather coats from the markets and from people wearing them. The citizens are complaining, saying, I paid for this coat, why can't I wear it? The police have been responding to the complaints, saying that wearing clothes designed to look like the highest dignity (laughs) is an impure trend to challenge the authority of the highest dignity. They instructed the public not to wear leather coats because it is part of the party's directive to decide who can wear them. <laughs> so, so far, only Kim Jong-un and Kim Yo-jong, his sister, can wear the leather coats. And so they've said it's also become a powerful symbol for women, too. Um, so I, I laughed about this. I thought, well, here we go again with North Korea. They, they said that uh, they also feel that um, some people, they felt, the lower-ranking people that were wearing these these coats that were particularly shoddy i love the way that (laughs) in other words they're like don't you dare you dare wear an imitation and on top of it it's a shoddy one well and so then the dear leader or the highest dignity felt that this might have been an oppression that was mocking him and mocking the ruling elite and this was a way for them to satirize him and uh, a way of doing it without going to prison or being tortured or being executed of course because earlier this this week in november uh uh, last week in November, a couple of North Korean authorities have sentenced a man to death for smuggling copies of the Netflix hit Squid Game. Mm, I did read that, too. I read that. Right. There was a couple of uh, illegal flash drives that come in. Several students were caught watching the series. They faced jail time. And uh, so everybody's upset that they've, uh, you know, that the Squid Game has breached the border. So don't uh, if we go there, John, no leather coats. You know, yeah. as you were talking, I had a, a flash. We were talking about uh, the the what was the highest divinity, the highest dignity, the highest dignity, and his sister. They sort of remind me of Boris and Natasha from uh, was that Rocky <laughs> and Bullwinkle? You know, what, wasn't yeah. she like kind of like she had that hat on and she was like so maybe she's the Natasha. Wow, I. Well, for, he lost some weight. They can't tell whether he's sick or he went on a diet. diet. They, said, okay. they said he's 5'8 in platform shoes. They don't really know how tall he is. They think he's about 5'2, but he's he's pushing 300 pounds or more. <laughs> they think he's down to about 260. Of course, you're not allowed to smoke anymore either in public. I don't know if you know that. So if you see pictures of him now, and he always has a cigarette in his hand, the cigarette's grayed out, but you can still see the finger, the two fingers up. So there's just this grayed out image where the cigarette is, yet there's ashtrays in front of him everywhere. <laughs> wait, wait. So, so he. So the government outlawed all smoking in public. Not allowed to be seen smoking. Smoking is bad for you. Okay, but when they, but when he, uh, oh, all right, thank you. You clarified that. Thank you. Except for the highest dignity. Well, he's not either. So, but what they're trying to do now, and it's hilarious. If you Google him, any pictures, they're they're trying to to gray out the cigarettes because they put out this directive of no smoking. But yet, how do you put the directive out in the dear leader? 
highest dignity, supreme commander, is is, is you know smoking. what, Tim? You know what would be the massively best birthday gift anybody could ever give you is a ride on the subway in North Korea. Can you imagine? Well, in the so capital then, city, because I think there's like seven stations. I don't know how, how big it is, but some you see pictures of these stations that are gorgeous, but no one's yes. on the train. Yeah. One's called Paradise. Paradise, yeah. One's called Heaven. So they've got, they, or not, not Heaven, but there's a Paradise or some other kind of you know great utopia. But then I looked because last week we talked about these horrible ornaments, and so I typed in Kim Jong Un ornament, and the little Rocket Man came up. That That's was, so. Um, if you the, if you're uh, watching YouTube on the lower left of the picture of the highest dignity wearing a white leather coat or a black, there is him riding some kind of atomic bomb. <laughs> a rocket, Rocket Man. So you can get that at Amazon. It's nine ninety nine. I think you're going to order it. You, you, I'm surprised you don't order it. You haven't ordered it already. Are you serious? I know. You well, are... my credit card was stolen. I told you that, right? Yeah. Well, the number was. I have no you credit card. So. You, you only had one card to begin with? That's all I had. And you won't let me use the business card. You're very strict. Well, look, you could use it, but, you know, I <laughs> just, you, you only ever had one card? I mean, most of us have like four or five at least. I got right? rid of them all. Really? And your, did your credit but, rating but suffer at all? this is a lesson. I've got rid of them all. Now I have nothing. Yeah, I'm waiting a, for I'm waiting for the bank to get me one. I thought they'd be a little quicker. Yeah, that is a good lesson, actually, because um, yeah, it's been five good, days. Yeah. Uh, all right. So what caught your eye? Well, as I said at the beginning of the broadcast, it's December, and I'm still waiting to find my version of the Declaration of Independence behind I don't know a, a paint by numbers thing at a tag sale. That kind of hooks into this. Uh, caught my eye because i'm obsessed with this like we watch antiques rose show now and then and someone will bring in like an old cracked pot and it turns out to be something re- super rare and they bought it for five bucks and it's worth two hundred thousand. so what caught my eye is a uh, mosaic from basically roman times caligula when he was emperor when he commissioned this that was spent 50 years of its life as a coffee table in someone's new york city apartment <laughs> And, and, you know, you read this and you're like, why can't that be me? <laughs> so the headline reads, Priceless Roman Mosaic Spent 50 Years as a Coffee Table in a New York Apartment. Um, so it goes like this. Daria, Dario del Bufalo, an Italian expert on ancient stone and marble, described in an interview with CBS 60 Minutes on Sunday how he found this mosaic. So this mosaic was just recently found in someone's New York City apartment. And returned to Italy, and I'll get into that in a second here. So in 2013, uh, Del Bufalo gave a lecture and signed copies of his book called Porf- Porphyry about the reddish-purple rock much used by Roman emperors. I have to do, dig into that and figure that one out more. But the book included a picture of the long-lost mosaic, which once formed part of a floor on one of two vast party boats commissioned by Caligula to float on a lake near Rome, and they sunk those boats when he was killed. You know, Caligula was killed rather violently. He was that crazy emperor. Um, and if you know I, Claudius, you know the whole story of him. The mosaic and other antiquities were recovered from the lake in the late 30s and housed in a museum right by the lake. But in 1944, as the Nazis retreated from Italy, the ships and many other treasures in the museum were burned. Nearly 70 years after that, as he signed copies of his book in New York City, Del Bufalo overheard a woman and a, uh, and a man talking, and, and the man said, what a beautiful book. Oh, Helen, look, that's your mosaic, because there's a picture of the other section of this, I think, that survived and was still in Italy. Yeah, that's my mosaic, she said. So Del Bufalo tracked down the young man who confirmed that Helen, in quotes, had the mosaic in her apartment in Manhattan. She was Helen Fiorati, an art dealer and gallery owner, and according to an interview she gave the New York Times in 2017, she and her husband, an Italian journalist, bought the mosaic from an Italian noble family <laughs> Italian noble family in the 1960s. When it arrived in New York, the couple turned it into a coffee table. It was an innocent purchase, and it's one of our favorite things. We've had it for over 45 years. So the office of the Manhattan District Attorney says evidence suggests the mosaic was stolen, possibly during the Second World War. Returned to Italy, it now sits on display at the Museum of the Roman Ships in Nemi in March of this past year. And the uh, the guy that wrote that book about that stone the emperors used who overheard her said, I felt very sorry for her, but it couldn't do anything different knowing that my museum is missing the best part that went through the centuries. So here she just for years had this, she's putting coffee on it and magazines and books and that, but if you go back centuries, bare, the bare feet of the Roman emperor Caligula was walking across that on his party barge. No doubt an orgy was taking place. Cause if you remember the, 
Caligula. He was uh, quite well known for that stuff. <laughs> so there you have it. Paid, I wonder what she paid for it. You know, they didn't the say. 60s. They did not say. And I and I should I should have done more R and D on that to figure it out. But if she bought it fifty years ago, it was basically just a hunk of stone with the mosaic in it. But yeah, I just I always think these things like. So she makes she made it into a coffee table. So because it was stolen, they just take it back. You don't get any money. Uh, apparently, you have to surrender it once they determine that the the uh, once they determine the uh, you know the the lineage of the piece or the uh, provenance. So yeah, could you imagine? Ding dong, buy a coffee table. Move the books off of it. It's going back to Italy. Because there's a in Philadelphia, there's a and a there was a cup stolen at the turn of the century in the eight from 1800s to 1900s. It was a rowing cup, solid gold supposedly. A rowing or cup, like a like a, yeah. a trophy, like like, like the a tro- like a trophy, the Stanley yeah. Cup or something. Okay. And it ended up on an antique store on Pine Street in Philadelphia, and somebody was walking through and saw it and said, "Oh my God, <laughs> this is the stolen cup." The cup. And it's still in litigation. It's been going on for years. Because the antique dealer says, well, I bought this at such and such auction. They said, well, it's stolen. Mm-hmm. And they're trying to prove, and they've been going back and forth as to who's, who the rightful owner is. And uh, But I thought with those sort of things, if it was stolen, like you said, if it's an artifact or something that you can prove was stolen, that if you paid for it, then that's too bad, right? You can't plead yeah. ignorance. That's how a lot of art from uh, many Jewish families in Germany even before the war began, were, were being stripped of their of their possessions, including their fine art. And some of them were Gustav Klimt selling. The, was the Woman in Gold was that movie about a a portrait that had been hung in a, a house in Germany for years, but the Nazis took it. And yeah, that stuff is uh, the whole art thing. But hey, let's not even. You go to the British Museum, and there's all the Elgin marbles. You know, have you been to the? They used to line the Parthenon, and I'm sure yeah. Greece, Greece would really like to have those back as part of their national heritage. Whole big thing. Moving on. <laughs> See, well, speaking of that, though, Barbados left the left the empire this week. Oh, uh, I was so disappointed. I, I the headline was something about um, saying that the queen was no longer the. That was that's what they are basically doing. The crown, uh, you know the. No longer yeah. has jurisdiction over Barbados, and but they've been a colony for over four hundred years, was it? Yeah, we'll see how this works out for them. Well, yeah. <laughs> There's someone without their credit cards unhappy down there. <laughs> My <laughs> one credit card. I can't believe that. Anyway. Uh, as many of you know, uh, Deep Discount is a partner of ours here on the Focus Group, and they've been with us for a long time now. And we would love you to visit their site by going to ours, focusgroupradio.com, and clicking on the Deep Discount logo. All right, so it is dun, 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 Black Friday and Cyber Week sale. So the whole site, anywhere you go, you're going to find a deal on, uh, on Deep Discount. And I would encourage you to roam and find things. I have the site up on our YouTube feed showing some of the stuff. There's games and toys and books and movies and pretty much everything you need to get, you can get there and get your shopping done. So without further ado, Tim, uh, did you take advantage and go shopping? I did, and I looked at, um, you know, we lost a great on Thanksgiving mm. Day, a yeah. theater great, American icon, uh, Stephen Sondheim, who, who died at 91, and the town's next to us in Roxbury, Connecticut. And uh, so I went and I immediately looked up at Deep Discount um, what might have been there related to Stephen Sondheim and found just released this past February called Six by Sondheim. And uh, it it took um, six of his what would be um, most innovative or uh, most storied songs um, from stage and how they were interpreted and sang. And then it's interspersed with a bunch of different interviews from from um, different performers with archival footage. And so it's these half a dozen favorite standards from the portfolio. And then, as I said, interspersed with um, with different interviews. So anyone who's a Sondheim fan or theater Sondheim fan or theater fan, I think this would be a great a great gift. It's everyone from Barbara Streisand, Frank Sinatra, Mandy Patamkin, um, Bernadette Peters, Bette Midler, Angela Lansbury, Hugh Jakeman, so forth and so on. So. It uh, originally came out uh, in 2013, but re-released in two uh, in this February 2021 on Blu-ray. And as John said, everything's on sale. You can get it uh, for under $20 at $15.76. It's one of these manufactured on demand. So um, for Blu-ray, which, that's interesting. Okay. Yeah, which you can you can get uh, get a deep discount. So the, I, in honor of uh, 
the passing. Of, you know. Yep, I, I picked a Sondheim. Uh, now, I am actually seeing the musical company on Friday with our friends Ed and Rafat. We, this had been decided a few weeks ago. They had tickets. Uh, Patty Lapone is in it, and uh, yep. obviously it's a Sondheim, so it feels kind of... Uh, pl- I'm glad we're seeing it on Friday, kind of in recognition. It was not planned to coincide with the, the poor gentleman's passing, but good call here. Um, and God, when you watch a documentary like this, you realize what an outsized footprint he had on the culture, right? With all, all the songs and the musicals. I went in a nostalgia direction with mine, and I saw this pop up a while ago, and I've been keeping my eye on it, but it's the movie Heaven Can Wait. It's the Warren Beatty remake of a classic, and it's from originally from 1978. And I saw this because it's been restored and cleaned up and has a new Blu-ray edition. It's one of my favorites from that time period. It stars Warren Beatty, Julie Christie, James Mason, Jack Warden as a football coach. Charles Grodin and Diane Cannon are hilarious. It also includes Buck Henry, Vincent Gardenia, and a whole great cast. It's it's a comedy, um, and... Uh, did you ever see Heaven Can Wait when you were? Um... I, I did, but I probably saw it um, in its original in its original year back in seventy six or seventy eight. But um, yeah, I, I, I pull- haven't seen it since. I, I think you should. I should. I should get it for you. Actually, um, I pulled an audio clip, and in this scene, um, Warren Beatty plays a football player who's who's killed in a car accident, but he's, he shouldn't have been killed. He should have lived, but he was pulled to heaven early by Buck Henry, who plays an angel. And they put him in a, they're trying to put him in a different body to live out his, his life. And they chose a guy named uh, Mr. Farnsworth, who's a wealthy, wealthy uh, industrialist. And Julie Christie's visiting him at his mansion. And here's a little clip of uh, a scene with him, Julie Christie, Diane Cannon, and uh, Vince, and um, I'm sorry, Charles Grodin. Miss Logan, I don't frighten anybody. What in God's name's that? Well, that that was my Mrs. Farnsworth. Sorry to disturb you, Mr. Farnsworth. Mrs. Farnsworth saw a mouse, but she's better now. She just saw a mouse? No, before, outside, but she relives it. So there you go. I mean, <laughs> Charles Grodin is brilliant. I highly recommend Heaven Can Wait. It's also under 20. It's for thirteen ninety nine. Restored Blu-ray. Highly recommended. And the release this week, the new release, is Shang-Chi and the Legend of the Ten Rings. Now, this is a movie that I wanted to see in theaters. It got great reviews. You know, I'm not a huge superhero Marvel fan, but this one, this one, when I read all the reviews, I think it's worth seeing. So if you haven't seen it in the theaters... You might want to pick it up because uh, it did get good reviews. Have you heard anything about it, Tim? I have not, but you know that's not my genre. But uh, for people that love it, I, I do know the reviews were good. Yeah, um, it's a Marvel film, and it did well at the box office. And uh, you know, I th- I saw I saw it come up, and I'm like, oh my god, it's a new release, and I didn't see it. So uh, Deep Discount has it for twenty nine ninety nine. So there you go. So time to uh, get your holiday shopping on. So uh, head over to focusgroupradio.com, click on the Deep Discount logo, start shopping away. I had picked Six by Sondheim. John had picked Heaven Can Wait, and the new release this week is Shang-Chi and the Legend of the Ten Rings. Again, if you go to Deep Discount, uh, you can get there through focusgroupradio.com. So we appreciate that. And if you get something, be sure to let us know, because if you take a picture of your invoice, or your uh, your product that you purchased, Mr. Nash, you're going to do what? Send it to letters at focusgroupradio.com, and you will get a free pair of Focus Group Radio socks. They're the purple version. I think they last forever, and they're they're highly coveted. So uh, you might want to do coveted. some shopping and send us a picture, and we'll get you some socks. So stay with us. We're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we have our business birthday and then some shop talk. So we'll be right back. You're listening to The Focus Group with Tim and John. Learn more at focusgroupradio.com. Now back to The Focus Group with Tim and John. Available pretty much everywhere. Oh, 
Welcome back to the Focus Group. Focusgroupradio.com is the URL for all things Focus Group, including our Tuesday podcast, which is TFGN Button. And as I said in our last segment, as Tim also teased, if you order something from Deep Discount between now and the end of the year, uh, take a quick pick of what you ordered and your packing slip, and we'll send you send it to letters at focusgroupradio.com, and we'll send you a pair of our Focus Group Radio socks. And some people have already done this, by the way, Tim. Have they? Yes, we have a number of listeners who have uh, sent us some of their selections, and I have highly approve of some of what they've been buying. They're uh, sometimes they're buying what we recommend, which I think is not a bad thing. <laughs> That's perfect, 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 perfect. All right. So without further ado, why don't we get bit rolling with the business birthday? Everyone does celebrity birthday greetings, but the Focus Group is the only show in the universe that celebrates business birthdays. So our birthday this week, born December 1st in 1899, is Robert Henry Winborn Welch Jr. It's quite a mouthful. Quite the name, I was going to say. Born December 1st in 1899, he died January 6th in 1985 at 85 years of age. He was an American businessman and a political organizer, and, uh, but he made his wealth in the candy business. And uh, but was also founder of the John Birch Society. So he um, he had gone to school in North Carolina. He was raised as a fundament, fundamentalist Baptist. Uh, fundamentalist Baptist. I didn't realize that was so difficult to say. <laughs> fundamentalist. Baptist, <laughs> oh, you just discovered, yeah. Which he said in his own words was insufferable. Um, so then he ended up going to the Naval Academy and then Harvard Law, but he didn't graduate from either. And he wanted to do. Um, he just felt like he wanted to do something with his hands. He ended up in Brooklyn, New York, and founded the Oxford Candy Company, which was a one-man operation, and hired his brother James. And so he had bought these recipes from somebody, um, and they made a, a caramel, um, he called him a sucker, but a hard caramel lollipop, which we know as the sugar daddy. Ah, okay, okay. And also had a chocolate bar named the Tar Baby. And he would distribute this throughout the Northeast. Well, in 1929, during the crash, um, his candy company failed. Yet his brother went off on his own. And his brother James, O. Welch, and started his own candy company, the Welch Company. And he ended up taking the recipes from his brother and expanding on them. And then hired his brother, Robert, to be the vice president of sales and advertising. And he did all kinds of crazy, crazy stunts. They said uh, everything from having, um, um, what's, what's the guy that uh, did the Billie Jean King? Why am I going to, why am I going to mess this up? Rick, uh, Bobby, uh, Bobby, um, Bobby, Riggs. Bobby Riggs, yeah. Bobby Riggs holding a big sugar daddy. Oh um, uh, yeah. Yeah. I remember that sugar daddy, caramel pop or whatever, but they developed the pom poms, candies, the sugar babies, the um, junior mints, so all the different different candies, and and he he had a, as vice president of sales and and advertising the revenues from the company um, when he started uh, really going national went from two hundred thousand dollars to twenty million <laughs> by nineteen fifty six. Quite a jump. So he took all that prosperity and money and decided he was very politically active or wanted to be politically active. It did not like the fact that he felt the United States was, at, particularly after World War II, just very much involved in too many places around the world and, and thought we should be more isolationists. So he founded this John Birch Society, which was a very conservative, Republican bent um, organization. He said he favored foreign policy of a fortress America rather than entangling the United States in a bunch of uh, alliances such as NATO or the United Nations. And so he was also a strong anti-communist. And um, so he decided that he was going to, he also didn't want us involved in Vietnam. And um, though he was a little bit more hawkish, he still felt that uh, we should just keep to ourselves and uh, not get involved in all these kind of foreign foreign, uh, issues going on around the world. And so he spent the rest of his life and the rest of his money um, on these these uh, causes and, and uh, conservative causes. But I love the candy aspect of it. But of course, um, you know, you always wonder: is, was something so simple as making this, the the uh, sugar daddy, which is still to this day? Did you ever did you ever eat a sugar daddy when you were little? Oh yeah, yeah, of course. It wasn't one of my favorites, but I've eaten it. Yeah. Junior mints. Joe, yeah, junior mints. In fact, I just saw a Seinfeld episode that had junior mints in it. 
Remember they That's go watch they watch go watch a surgery and they fight over a junior mint. And it, it goes into someone and it saves them somehow. Paradoxically, <laughs> junior mints are good if you throw them in the throw them in the freezer. Yes, get them they, hard. They, well, that's like any kind of mint cookie. You get them uh, like a Girl Scout mint thin mints when they're on when that's the season. They go in the refrigerator. Right. So he uh, so he died. Uh, he died as I said in January sixth, nineteen eighty five, and uh, so the John Birch that. Society is still around, right? It is. Um, I used to know people, you know, it was always sort of kind of, I want to say it was a little bit like Scientology. I mean, it, it, in that I never really knew exactly what they did. They said the membership was always kind of quiet. Um, you know, when it started, he had 11 members. They had up over 100,000 members um, at one time. Uh, they said at its peak, they had 120,000 members. Um, they weren't necessarily known for their political influence. Um but its notoriety, they thought, was out of proportion to its numbers. Mm. Okay, because I've heard the ter- I've heard the name of the society before. I just didn't really know what the, where their tentacles went in terms of, uh, you know, yeah, politics. They're, yeah, one of their promises was to get the commies out of uh, out of the fabric. Of oh, America. there you go, <laughs> the Red Scare. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So you know they were involved All in right, a lot of things. But business. anyway, yeah. So happy birthday. Good business it's birthday. And I like the Junior Mint tie-in. That that's a that's a good one candy yeah if he, if he had done yeah. neko wafers that would be like a whole nother d- dimension entirely so as i mentioned at the beginning of the show we're gonna wrap up with a shop talk and uh this is one that i found and it's called uh the headline reads the four business books everyone should read according to adam brotman who is a former starbucks executive and in fact he is now building out a um a new company called bright loom which kind of is based on some of the Starbucks technology for placing orders and retaining customers. And he um, was, he sat down with, I think it was Business Insider. Is this the, uh, yeah. And, uh, or, or CNBC and uh, kind of went through his four go-to business books. And so we're going to talk a little bit about that. And by the way, this guy was also, uh, Brotman was also briefly the um, CEO of J Crew, which was kind of interesting to go from coffee to J. Crew, and then back again to, to Brightloom. His first book he talks about that, that he thinks is you know he's ex- he exclusively reads nonfiction, by the way, and and I I kind of like he said you know his his worldviews are formed by reading, and he reads mostly nonfiction. And I would say that's kind of narrow. I think fiction fictional fiction and literature can add dimensions that nonfiction can't, meaning just different ways of thinking and characters, and I don't know. So, minus that little sidecar, let's get going here. The first book he talks about is one called The Anti-Social Network. Now, this is a brand new book, meaning it came out in January of 2021. And it's written by Ben Mesrick. Um, and he's one of Bronfman's favorite authors. He's written 20 books exploring the intersections between technology, finance, and risk-taking. And it tells the story of that thing that happened at the beginning of the year where all these uh, small investors went in and bought all that GameStop stock and shot the price up and basically bankrupted a, a Wall Street hedge fund who had a, you know, placed holds on that stock for it to go down. And he says here, Mesrick's Mesrich's books, Mesrick's books often tackle the theme of taking on the system, modern versions of David and Goliath. The reason I love Anti-Social Network is because I learned a ton, and it's not just educational; it also has a cinematic page turning appeal to it. What did you, did you look up any reviews of this one or read about this? Too? No, it's not a ho hum to me. Well, okay. So in the theme of, I, I looked it up, and I did find some reviews that were not; they were very critical, but in a very smart way. One guy's like, I've read this before. This is he didn't go deep enough into why this was happening and why it could happen again. There were very some really smart critical reviews of it, but it it's not one I would put on my list. This next book, though, Tim, why don't you tell us about this one? Well, did, but did they say? Was there anything else about that book that any did people agree with him? Did oh some, yeah, yeah. Some, some people loved it. They thought it was a really yeah. great eye-opening look at at this GameStop thing and how this the small investor can tip the balance in their favor and. There was a lot of that, but you know, then right. it was counterbalanced with people who were like, well, they could have gone deeper. He could have done this. And a lot of people said it was not one of Mesrick's best books, that, that some right. of his other 20 books were probably better. The second book is The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People by uh, Stephen Covey. And I, I uh, had worked for a manager that um, insisted we all read this and would have book club every after uh, once an afternoon on Thursdays. 
It's a 1989 classic. It's one of the most popular leadership books in the U.S. And lots of people swear by it. It's a step-by-step approach to improve both your personal and professional life, tips on time management, positive thinking, that sort of stuff. And, you know, I, as I started reading it, I remember this. Um, we had read it. And after about the third or fourth little session with our group, I shut down. Because to me, um, it, it has very much a religious bent to it. Really? That did not come through in the, in the reviews that I read. And uh, I, did, I told Tim before the broadcast that I went on Amazon and looked for the one and two star reviews for all these books. <laughs> so I wonder if you'll appreciate this review. Uh, that came from a professor. He said, everything in the book can be done, but it is too complicated to implement. How effective is this book for the masses? If you go into the general population and ask how many of you, how many people have applied these principles, I know few will say they do. Let's say you ask the most motivated and educated how many of you use this book as a guide for success. Again, I know zero who do. I have hundred, I've asked hundreds as, as a teacher this question, business people, PhDs, politicians. It is not widely used, um, but this advice in the book. So I will be, so then he says, so I will, in my humble view, give you what I tell my students in less than one paragraph, how to be successful. One, you have to truly want to do it. So whatever it takes to have, to move, have forward motion in your goal, do that. Practice the fundamentals, practice, 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 experts, advice, etc. Two, know you will fail. Whatever you are working toward if it is a challenging thing and uh, it's new to you, you will have failure. Analyze it and learn from it. And three, never give up. You have to be more persistent than the problem. If you are not, you do not truly want to do it. <laughs> that was it. That was his take. He said he could, you know, it, does this, did you read, finish the book? Well, no. He, so he was a Mormon and uh, Covey was a Mormon and a lot of the teachings were Mormon, which, you know, there's lots of discussion whether Hard Mormonism work. is Christian Christianity and so forth and so on. But it it became after the third or fourth session and the and the and the the manager that I worked with is, was extremely religious. And a couple of the other people were religious and I just felt like I was being almost indoctrinated. Needed. And okay. I and I actually said something to HR and they shut it right down. Really? And uh, yeah, there was no more book club. Um because it really is. I, I would not. Um, yeah, I, I was a suspect of of the whole book. Mm. So it would not be one I would recommend. Well, I the reason we did this is Tim and I see a lot of business books. Uh, we, we have authors send them to us. We've read them. And we, we really are not lying when we say, and I don't think I'm making this up, that they can be all classified into a couple of different silos and the advice all tends to be it's the rare one that um that pops through and really makes us you know uh take note this next book that uh this gentleman recommends is called shoe dog and it's by phil knight the uh, founder of nike and um the book details how he turned nike into a brand worth over 30 billion in the memoir uh, this is the book you need to pick up if you're looking to be inspired brotman says it really is this incredible story of an entrepreneurial determination and vision. Um, Knight co-founded Nike with his former University of Oregon track coach Bill Bowman in 63 under the name Blue Ribbon Sports. In those early days, he would travel to track meets and sell shoes from the trunk of his car. I mean, that's dedication. In 2016, Knight told CNBC's Jim Cramer that building Nike was the most fun he ever had, even if people doubted his ability to succeed. We knew he could fail. We just didn't think we would. Uh, any thoughts on Shoe Dog? Yeah, I, I'm sure it's an inspiring story, and uh, it's probably just as as it was mentioned that it was it would be inspiring. I, I think this is one of these though. Um, it, it was about determination. I mean, we all know the story, right? He made the shoes up with a waffle iron. You know, dot dot dot. We all know that the but, Nike logo costs like what fifteen hundred bucks from a graphic designer that did it. You know, in a couple days, which is amazing. The swoop thing, right? Yeah, so but so I'm sure it's I'm sure there's an inspiration there. I'm not so sure, other than the stick to itiveness, right? Of of stick to, sticking to something and and uh, and being passionate about it. I don't know which which other other than a great story. To me, it's probably a great story if you're an entrepreneur. I'm not so sure what the lessons would be other than to stick to it. Do you want to read what a um, uh, a three star review said of the book? <laughs> 
Here's one. Uh, this guy was also claimed to be a professor. I have read many business history books. McDonald's, McDonald's, Coca-Cola, Walmart, AT&T, FedEx, House of Morgan, GE, Standard Oil, U.S. Steel, Ford, GM, DuPont, Boeing, Amazon, Apple, Curtis Wright, and several others. It's a long list. This is unquestionably the worst. One of the few books I've just thrown into curbside recycling bin. <laughs> And, and I mean, they're outliers. I know I went and purposely did that to counterbalance what we're doing here, but um, I do this as a reader. I will look for those reviews to see if I'm, I'm right. they, they resonate. This last one, you want to go through this one here? This one, pour your heart into it, how Starbucks built a company one cup at a time. And so Brotman says he, he, he actually read this before he actually worked or was offered a job at Starbucks. But it chronicles how uh, Howard Schultz had grown Starbucks from one store in Seattle to the largest coffee house chain. And some anecdotes about how he convinced Bill Gates, uh, Bill Gates' dad, to invest in the franchise and then explain why he did what he did. And uh, I would think this was probably a good story. I've heard bits and pieces about it, and I would be interested in reading about it only because I know Starbucks did a lot of things that people said you should not do. For instance, they would – I know when I was in Oregon um, – and they were expanding, they would do things like put one store on one, uh, put a Starbucks on one corner and right across the street, put another one where somebody would say, you should never do that. And both of them would do well. <laughs> That's so, and, uh, isn't that wild though, that they would both do well, right? That's <laughs> Right. And so there were things like that, that they experimented with. And then, you know, who's going to pay $5 for coffee? Well, a lot of people apparently. So, um, so I would want to read about this one. Um, I would think this would be a good business story to read about. I don't know what the reviews say though. Pretty much the same thing. Uh, the reviews came up as this would be interesting to see, to get into his mind, to think of what he was doing. One reviewer said that Schultz himself wasn't much of a writer, and the, the book does read like a company history you might read on the back of one of his coffee cups. However, it did give you insight into these char charismatic characters who are inspired to do certain things in business. And we, we say to ourselves when we look in the rearview mirror, how did that happen? Why don't we right. think of putting a coffee shop like that? Up? <laughs> so, so there you go. There was a guy that um, went to my college, Don Ritter, a very successful business uh, businessman, and he had talked. We, we're going to have him on the show, and I think once we get some of this tech figured out and get out of this uh, event, we might have him on. But he had picked seven books he felt everybody should read. And he gave a graduation speech about it. And I actually went and got a few of them. He gave all seven books to every graduate and said, wow. if you, he said, I, he said, I guarantee you, he, you know, he said, if you read these seven books, he said, you will be successful. He said, if you read them and take something away from them, I guarantee you that you'll be successful. And I was curious about it. And so actually I went and I bought a few of them and I've started reading them. And, um, but I thought he'd be interesting to come on because he had said that he had, over his 40 years in business, this is kind of the advice that he would give when somebody says, go give a graduation speech. And he had said, he had put together his list of seven books he felt that helped guide him to, to be successful in his life and career. So I, I thought that was interesting. So it's, um, and there are books I would have never read or some I've never heard of. So. I think it's a great idea. And we are going to be switching up the format a little bit for the new year. Um, so that as Tim said, we could bring more voices in like we used to do uh, earlier before the event hit. Um, all right, I like that. And uh, I also, I don't know if I mentioned this, Tim, you know the movie that I was in, Coded? Right. The, uh, the documentary? It's now streaming on Paramount+. Plus. So if you're a Paramount Plus subscriber and you want to see me as a talking head in a very, very cool documentary about uh, J.C. Leindecker, famous fashion illustrator from the 20s and 30s, was a peer and contemporary and mentor to Norman Walkwell, but he happened to be gay, um, the documentary is called Coded, C-O-D-E-D. -E so you might want to pick that up or check it out. So I tried to watch it over the weekend, and it said my it said I needed to get new equipment for the TV to handle Paramount Plus. Does that make sense? Not at all. No. Comcast. No. That's well. So how do I do it? Do I have to download a, an app? Or unless something? you did it through the Apple TV, you were trying to do it through the com the TV through the Comcast system. Yeah. Yeah, you might have to download Paramount Plus as an app for the Apple TV, and you can sign up for a free trial for seven days or a month and sign up for seven days and watch Coded, then cancel. But I think that's how you might have to do it. Through Apple TV, I can yeah. do it. Yeah. I have Apple TV, so could I just watch it through Apple TV? You might have to download Paramount Plus and sign up, but yeah, you can do it that way. Okay. That's crazy. It's so much 
Crazy, 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 these TVs, John. Mm, well, they don't make it easy. Uh, trust me. I, I was helping Bob's mom figure something out, and I thought it was going to be simple. It wasn't. And I'm like, wow, could you guys make this any more complicated? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Hey, so thanks for joining us today. We appreciate uh, the time you spent with us. And uh, be sure to uh, to be safe out there. Go to focusgroupradio.com. Click on our friends at Deep Discount and uh, do some of your holiday shopping there. Uh, some of the movies we picked this week, Six by Sondheim, John picked Heaven Can Wait, and the new release is Shang-Chi and the Legend of the Ten Rings. We also um, encourage you to listen to some of our old shows and, not, and, for, and don't forget our uh, Tuesday podcast, which is TFG Unbuttoned, which is also housed at focusgroupradio.com. And find out more about us throughout the week on our uh, Facebook page, which is Focus Group Radio. We hope you all have a good week, and we'll see you on Tuesday. Take care. It's The Focus Group with Tim Bennett and John Nash. Accessible on all platforms. Subscribe, like, and rate us on your platform of choice. Learn more at focusgroupradio.com. That was a stunning focus group.